Welcome to the third webinar in our special series to celebrate the fifth anniversary of Pope Francis's Laudato Si on care for our common home. Last week, we listened to three indigenous women reflect on their experiences of resisting extractivism in Canada and Latin America. Today, we bring together panelists also from Canada and Latin America to reflect on what a just transition might mean, a transition that seeks to decolonize overcome racism and social injustice and create a truly life-sustaining way of being, as well as the ethics and worldviews that might support such change. A special welcome today to our panelists, Ali Rujo, Fridays for Future Toronto, Mauricio Lopez from the Pan-Amazonian Ecclesial Network based in Quito, Ecuador, John McCarthy, scientist and Jesuit in Sudbury, Ontario, and Miriam Vilela of the Earth Charter based in Costa Rica. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, we're gonna introduce you properly in a few minutes. My name is Anne-Marie Jackson. I'm the director of the Jesuit Forum for Social Faith and Justice and we're based in Toronto. The Jesuit Forum works for social and ecological justice through small group dialogue. The hope is to build trust and friendship to create an atmosphere of deeper sharing and to foster listening. The aim is to bring about a change of heart and open minds. We want to offer today, again, words of solidarity to communities of color and indigenous peoples everywhere for the violence of racism. We continue to mourn for the family and friends of Floyd George, George Floyd. We remember those who have died in police incidents in Canada, including most recently DeAndre Campbell, Regis Koczynski Paquette, and Chantelle Moore, a young Indigenous woman who was shot and killed by police in New Brunswick only two days ago. And we keep in mind the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls whose homicide rate is roughly four and a half times higher than that of all other women in Canada. We recognize the privilege that many of us have of being white um, as a call to action that requires collective work to distribute more evenly both access to power and to resources. And we humbly dedicate our work to justice for all. Let us begin um, first by acknowledging the sacred lands upon which we live and work. Um, we're here in, in Toronto and um, we acknowledge that this land is a, is a living community and has many inhabitants, animals, birds, water creatures, insects, fungi and microbes, all of whom sustain life. These territories where they've been the site, have been the site of uh, human activity for over 15,000 years. The land where I speak from is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Patoon First Nations, the Onondawaga, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory is the subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations. Today we meet on these lands, which are still the home of myriad living beings and the home of many indigenous peoples across Turtle Island. We acknowledge all of them with gratitude and we remember our sacred responsibilities as treaty peoples. And, and I have to say, we try to say these words um, not as a regular thing, but with conviction and as a constant reminder of our responsibilities. In our webinar series, we've been exploring many interconnected themes raised by Pope Francis on care for our common home. Today, it's about transition. We want a just way forward that is inclusive of everyone. The changes we need call for different kinds of work and we want to ensure jobs for all as production priorities shift um, and, um, and as we hope they will. We recognize that any truly just transition has to include the voices and participation of people of color, as well as indigenous and marginalized people. We have to work, walk this path together. The speaker in our first webinar, Leonardo Boff, has said 
now is a unique opportunity for us to rethink the way we live in our common home, the way we produce, consume and relate to nature. Our latest issue of Open Space, um, our small um, uh, newsletter, quotes Chris Taylor, who says simply, do we choose the economy of destruction or the ecology of love? Pope Francis says, what, are we what we are living now is a place of metanoia or conversion, and we have the chance to begin. So let's not let it slip from us and let's move ahead. With that, let us hear the reflections of our four panelists who come from different contexts, which will enrich and inspire us. So we have an hour and a half and no more and uh, there will be an opportunity to ask questions um, through the question box on your screen. And now I am going to introduce my colleague, Mark Hathaway, to, um, for him to introduce our first speaker. Mark. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm really, really delighted today uh, to introduce to you Eleanor Rougeau, uh, who moved from France to Canada to pursue studies at the University of Toronto in economics and public policy. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Ali for the first time when she was in a class of mine on interdisciplinary uh, environmental studies. And uh, she's a great student, even gave a presentation in the class about Fridays for Future, which is where she now works as the uh, Toronto coordinator for Fridays for Future, has since January of 2019. But really, her activism goes back to the age of 10. She's been an activist for human rights and uh, climate justice since then, and particularly since high school, uh, her activism has focused on, on climate issues. So uh, Fridays for Future, of course, is a worldwide movement uh, where students have been striking and protesting to demand bold climate action from all levels of government uh, and has just had you know, a tremendous uptake in the last year and a half or so. So uh, welcome, Ali. We look forward to hearing from you today. Hi Mark, thank you very much for this introduction and hello everybody. Um, I'm very grateful for uh, the space you're giving me and, and to have this opportunity. I'm just gonna share slides quickly with you. Um, there we go. So hi everybody, as it was mentioned, I uh, organized with Fridays for Future the Toronto chapter, but there are chapters really all around the world um, in a very grassroots way. And um, I wanna talk today, um, you know, I'm not gonna try to outsmart my fellow panelists on, on the values and the specific policies that would go in a just recovery or green recovery. But from what I know is more, you know, why now? Why we need to organize now for this just recovery in the midst of all this chaos and um, how? And obviously how is a huge answer. And um, I know I can't give you the exact road to how, I do know the thing that's the wrong answer and that's not doing anything. Not doing anything will definitely not get us where we need to be. So I wanna give you what the youth have been doing and hopefully that gives you ideas, tools, inspiration, energy, anything you need to fight for that green recovery. So as Mark mentioned, Fridays for Future was the group that organizes those big climate strikes and they were fantastic and they actually worked and government started caring more about the youth and, and the future. But look at this picture. In times of COVID, it is extremely difficult to have these sort of events. And now we are seeing them across the world to fight police brutality and racism and white supremacy. But that's because all these things kill more than COVID could ever kill. And so, and so they're extremely justified. And you know, the Youth of Fridays for Future has said, we're gonna support these, we're gonna to go to these, and we're not gonna put our own marches on top of these. So we had to re-strategize, you know, how do we demand for change in another way? And I'll be honest with you, we've also had to change the way we organize internally, because as youth, we really liked to gather, and, you know, energy is contagious. Um, sometimes even in a meeting, you can feel potential tensions, you can, uh, you know, feel each other's energy, which doesn't happen on a Zoom meeting at all. And so we've had to change and things have been, I always say like our, our organizing ways have been shattered. And at the same time, and you most likely know this, the climate crisis is still super real. 
And if COVID taught me anything, it was really that we weren't ready. We aren't ready for disruption. We aren't ready for um, some emergency situations. Clearly, we just don't know what to do when things don't go business as usual, but, you know, when, when things are not exactly like we had predicted them. And that's climate. Once we go above these thresholds, as you know, things go into an unknown territory. At the same time, there's been a bit of a harmful rhetoric going around saying we are the virus. And that's a very, very harmful um, sentence. And a few indigenous elders have come out saying, you know, this is a harmful sentence because it makes it seem like we're not meant to be on earth and that's not true. It makes it seem like we're all responsible for the climate crisis equally and that's not true. And it makes it seem like we're hopeless. It makes it seem like we should just not be part of these ecosystems. So instead of that, let us use this moment to say we're not the virus and we can be part of the solution. We can actually tackle the COVID crisis, the economic crisis, the climate crisis at once. And likely we can also tackle other crises like the homelessness crisis, the mental health crisis, all of these by having this really comprehensive green just recovery. So, you know, why now? Like why, why is this so important to do during this confusing time? Can we not wait until it's over and then we'll be fine? I study public policy and the one thing my professors love to talk about is the window of opportunity. It's the thing that you know will be on the test and we know your paper will be about it. And we have the window of opportunity of a generation. We have governments that are looking for solutions. We have industries that are ready to re-strategize. We also have millions of people that are losing their jobs and that need an answer quickly. We need innovation and and we had lost that a bit recently, we have the public that trusts scientists and we have politicians that understand that acting fast saves lives. Now think about that carefully. That hasn't happened in a while. And so it is extremely important to focus on this now and to grab this, but it's also extremely important to, that we grab it, that the people on this panel understand this opportunity because we're really not the only ones to see the window of opportunity. Now I don't you know, need to call out who the bad guys are in the story, but what we have to fight right now is not a neutral outcome post COVID versus a good outcome, green recovery. What we have to fight is a really, really bad outcome versus a good outcome with a green recovery. And the bad outcome could be those big tech companies taking more of our data and taking over more and more surveillance and communities that lost strength and populace taking over more and fear taking over and racism taking over because that's also at risk during COVID. So we need to be stronger and louder than that opposing side. And that's why you can't just, you know, we can't just be sitting here thinking would be nice to act. It's absolutely crucial that we act. All right, so I hope you're scared, but just a little bit, not too scared. How do we actually organize during COVID? What do we do? I'm speaking from a youth perspective in an urban center. So I know the reality is very different for other people. And I'm just bringing these ideas up as potential pathways and definitely not the ultimate solution. What we focused on is number one, restructuring. We had been emergency planning since the very first day Greta Thunberg started striking. We had been doing strikes after strikes and it worked super well when we had the momentum. But COVID kind of killed our momentum. And so now we have, we kind of have to, but it's also a chance to restructure. So when I say restructure, I mean, we've been creating subgroups that acknowledge differences, you know, like working youth compared to high school youth compared to university youth. And in university, something fascinating that's been happening is that we've been able to recruit much more people that have a bit more time right now or want to do something for their community. And we've actually been working with student unions, student clubs, and um, some people of academia, so some of the professors, TAs. And we've been trying to normalize the idea of a big climate strike, not just a walkout, 
not just 200 students per campus deciding to go out because they're already convinced. We're preparing over the next summer, the next six months, the idea that a strike works, that mobilizing massive amounts of people works, so that when we get to go back after the pandemic, it's gonna be massive and it's gonna be powerful because it's gonna be a real strike. That's been one of our focus. And if you're, you know, if you're working in, in academia, in the nonprofit sector, if you're in a labor union, I think reaching out to any of your, of your local youth climate uh, strike group right now would be a great time because we can plan ahead. We really have six months ahead to plan um, at least. A second thing we've been doing is taking time to educate ourselves and our supporters. We have frequent supporters. And I always joke that um, Fridays for Future is like a gateway movement. So you come in because you know you kind of care about your grandkids and you get out and you understand um, racial inequalities and you understand indigenous sovereignty. And that's what we're trying to do. So we have programs internally where um, it's kind of like a sort of reading club where we, we just kind of bring bring in certain resources and we read them as a group, try to discuss them. But also we have weekly strikes where frequent supporters come on and they listen to experts talking about each little section of climate justice. And that's very important right now because maybe people, some people have more time. And at the same time, it's really important that this whole understanding happens because that's what's gonna fuel the just recovery. You know, if the public is all for climate justice and the justice part especially, politicians know they can have a just recovery. And then our third uh, pillar in a way is maintaining ties with our community. And that's been really hard because I personally don't like digital interactions as much as I like human ones. So the younger youth in our group especially have been leading really good social media campaigns and having you know videos and we've had much more frequent but short calls. Uh, we're trying to have you know, movie nights all together. And these may sound a little trivial, but honestly, it's very, very important to keep that community because we want our values to be kept. And so when we choose the film that we screen together, when we choose the theme of the call, we make sure that the values stay the same. Togetherness, solidarity instead of having people all going their different ways. And that fosters thoughts like individualism and maybe hopelessness, apathy. So that's why it really matters. And that's why it's not, not trivial. Now, and especially if you're an organizer, but also if you're just thinking of organizing, demanding for a just recovery will need what we've always needed when we ask for something, putting pressure on elected officials. That doesn't change. And I don't know about you, but when I started this um, social distancing, self-isolation, I started introspecting a lot. I started looking at my actions and thinking, oh my gosh, this is so wasteful and I need to go fully zero waste right now. And, you know, I started just introspecting a lot. I want to be the perfect citizen and super productive during my time at home. And then I realized, you know, who's not thinking about how to be perfect right now? Exxon Mobile. <laughs> and all those big companies that have something they also want by the end of this pandemic. And so just like we reclaimed the space by taking the streets, and just like we reclaimed the space by being super loud, we need to reclaim the political digital space. Now you might be thinking, what the hell is that? And honestly, it means maybe trying to get um, either by email, maybe Zoom calls, maybe phone calls with your elected officials. It means making sure on social media, you're very vocal about what you, you're talking about. And it means looking again at the actions of these companies, not letting things go by because people are not paying attention. If you have the time and the energy to look at it, look at it for the rest of us. Look in the media, make sure you find those, that one little piece about what a company is pushing for and broadcast it more, right? It's really, really important because a lot of people right now don't have the time and we shouldn't be demanding from people that are you know, on the front lines of the crisis to do this work. So those of us that have time should be doing much more of it. So I think, you know, when I think of that, the, the motto I try to give myself is, I need my MP, my MPP, so this is in Canada, you know, my member of parliament, member of provincial parliament, the CEO of whoever I bank with to know my name and know 
I stand for just recovery. That's how you put pressure. That's, the, that's what we're aiming for by the end of our social distancing. All right, so many of you might be watching this already being activists, and I guess I might have not taught you anything new. And some of you might be thinking you wanna get more into it, or you have, you're in a position where you have access to a lot of youth that has time, you're in a position where you actually have a voice. And that's where you can really come in. Because when you're gonna demand for that just transition, make sure to really demand it with youth in mind. We are really scared right now. And there's honestly a lot, a lot of anxiety within um, you know, more of the youth community because we're being told we're gonna graduate in the middle of a massive recession. We're gonna graduate and countries are all gonna be in debt and all of our systems will be out of money for us. And so we won't have things, you know, we're being told all these things. And we also know that we have a climate crisis to, you know, to solve. So asking for a green recovery could also ask for more positions uh, for youth in decision-making bodies, you know, for a long time, since the Rio summit, we were supposed to have youth bodies making decisions that never happened. That would be a good one to ask for. So I'll just say this one more time. There's an enormous, enormous opportunity for you to act, especially if you're someone that actually uh, wasn't as directly impacted by the, the COVID crisis. And so you have the time, the energy, uh, maybe the money to help. And this huge opportunity should really be done with youth in mind. Um, and especially you know, with youth of color in mind, because this would be an amazing opportunity to think, actually think long-term not just how we get out of this tomorrow, but how we get out of this for the long run so it doesn't happen again. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, having a few technical problems today. Thank you very much, Ali. I really appreciate that and um, and, um, and, and also your call for action, the urgency. And I did learn from listening to you and, um, and, and I was really interested to hear all the planning that is taking place. So thank you so much. And uh, now I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker who is Mauricio Lopez. Mauricio is uh, Mexican by birth, Ecuadorian by choice and Amazonian by vocation. Uh, Mauricio serves as the executive secretary of RAPAM, the Pan-Amazonian Ecclesial Network. Um, he was a member of the Pan-Amazonian Synod and the preparation team for it, the big meeting um, uh, that took place in um, the end of last year in Rome. Um, but the preparation took place in the, in the Amazon region. He he's, uh, was executive secretary of the Pastoral Social uh, Caritas Ecuador, and um, he's an Ignatian layperson um, and being president of the global uh, Christian life community. His academic background is in human development, social sciences, theology, and administration. And we're really happy to welcome you, Mauricio. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. Uh, it is a privilege to be here with you today. I like to start by bringing into our midst the people who in the Amazon have been infected by this pandemic. We have, uh, as, as, for, as is today, about 235,000 people infected in the whole Pan-Amazon region and 10,000 people who have died from it. And in the indigenous communities where things are even more challenging uh, for various reasons that we will talk about later, we have 7,000 indigenous brothers and sisters already infected and about 650 of them who unfortunately died. And the problem is that uh, those uh, indigenous peoples infected represent about 120 indigenous nationalities. So it is something that's hurting them and it might hurt them in their process into the future. So I'd like to start with an image to share with you in the presentation. And it's a phrase from Tillar de Chardin, which I think is very much in the core of this call for our discussion today and in the fifth anniversary of Laudato Si, but especially in the midst of this pandemic. And he said, 
in 1955. Each element of the cosmos is woven with all of the others. It is impossible to break this network. The universe is held by its unity. This is the moment in which we have to uh, acknowledge our failure as humankind and recognize how we can go in a different direction. Of course, the indigenous peoples are not perfect, but they have so much to offer to us, their wisdom, their uh, ancestral background, and how they have been able to relate with their uh, context, with their land, with one another, and also with their own spirituality is a call for transformation uh, to which we need to pay attention. I think it is a moment in which we notice that uh, uh, beyond the pandemic, in the different realities that this pandemic expresses or um, allows us to see and we were not seeing uh, is an appeal for change. So that's why I want to present this image in terms of the invitation for a different way of relating with one another and of relating with creation, a way of caring, of protection, of producing, maintaining life and sustaining life. And this phrase from the Mayas, from the indigenous tradition, is very important to understand why we are here today and how we can really uh, make it out of it. Uh, they took our, our fruits, they cut our branches, they burned our trunks, but they could not kill our roots. This is the moment in which we have to go back to our roots and read from our own, own history to understand where we come from. So this is the only way in which we can honor those uh, who were our predecessors and respond in a different way to their reality. Business as usual, as it was said before, is not an option. And another phrase from uh, Teilhard de Chardin, which I think is really connected to Laudato Si's appeal, is we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. This changes everything. And I think this is where we have to observe what are the elements of, uh, oh, just a second, yes. Sorry, I had a problem with my video. So in this moment, we are called to recognize what is the main challenge today. The, the COVID-19 pandemic is truly a challenge, but this is not the core challenge we have at hand. It has, as I said, uh, expressed and showed what was underneath. And the single most important sin or challenge or structural injustice is inequality. This is as clear as it can be. Today, there is no future for this planet when we have 1% of the population concentrating more than 82% of all of the uh, elements of the planet and the riches of the planet. At the same time, we have six families and their corporations concentrating the same amount of money as the 50% poorest part of the planet. That is six families, same as 300, 800 million people. This is not possible uh, to stay like this. It needs to change. There is no possibility for a future in the planet if things continue as such. And at the same time, we are using today and um, consuming the uh, same amount of elements in this planet as, the, as if it refers to 1.6 planets. But the problem is that we only have one planet. We are somehow putting in risk the future generations by doing what we do today. And this is uh, all, all uh, focused in this vision of growth. This perspective of growth has no future and needs to be changed. From the indigenous perspective, we need to understand that the spirituality, the spiritual connection offers different perspective and need to be put into the discussion. These are different values that are offered to us and need to be embraced. So when you ask, what do you think a just tran transition would look like? I would say that the peripheries need to become the center. All those persons, realities that have been excluded 
but uh, which have seeds of a possible different future need to be placed in the center, not to overcome the center and become it and make the same mistakes, but to illuminate and help the center change the development model, the global perspective on growth needs to change. In these, the peripheries on the indigenous communities, migrants, all of those who have been considered excluded in a, uh, an evangelical perspective, in a gospel perspective, also they offer us perspectives for a different future. So in this sense, we are also trying to bring those voices into the center. Um, I'm sorry that I'm having problems with my video again. Uh, there is. Okay, so the peripheries need to illuminate and transform the center without pretending to become the center instead, but by maintaining their connection to the root, to the soil, to what's considered marginal, which will become germinal uh, as well. We need to bring a perspective on Kairos, a different perspective on time, we have to be able to see the precise time, the time of the spirit, a spiritual perspective on time, which is um, more important than Kronos. We have been dominated by Kronos, by being successful, by getting a gain immediately, regardless of the crisis that we are uh, causing to the planet, planet. We need to enter into this Kairos perspective, which is connected to the spiritual life, connected to one another. We need to go back to a communal drive. We've lost the capacity to connect with one another. And this one needs to overcome the individual drive our societies are uh, sustained on. And then the traditional wisdom, our Western knowledge, our Western uh, development and growth models have put us in this situation. So we need to be able to somehow change and embrace these other types of knowledge, the traditional wisdom, which has so much to offer. So in terms of values that we need to bring into the table, I'd like to offer you four words which could help us in this discussion. So the first one, which was already mentioned uh, and said by Pope Francis is metanoia. What does that mean? That is a radical, profound transformation of the heart, a conversion from within, we might have all of the actions that you may in front of us. We may have another uh, document like Laudato Si, if there is no true transformation from within, there's no possible change. It starts with each person. It starts with the personal decision of looking inwards and then recognizing that, that I need to change. The second word is alterity. We need to recognize that the mystery of life, our future, can only be possible when in connection with the others. And these others make my life uh, gain sense and meaning. But now the challenge is even more difficult. Can we acknowledge our sister mother earth as Laudato Si presents as that other? Are we capable of changing this dominating pattern as to recognize that sister mother earth as a counterpart, as that? Maybe if you may not an equal, but in this reciprocity perspective as relying on one another to continue and maintain life. The third element is discernment, to be able to recognize the root of this sins, the structural causes of this inequality. And this has names and it has also expressions in our corporate world where extraction as it's happening these days in the Amazon, We've had the highest rate of deforestation in these past months, even more than the total of last year. The quarantine has put people under cover when, when it was possible, but those extract, extractive industries from our countries or from the north of the northern areas of the planet continue to destroy our planet. How do we discern the best way to respond to that reality, but truly understanding that? Integral ecology is the single most important category that we have today, and it's right there for us in Laudato Si. Unfortunately, it has not been acknowledged or embraced by most of us. What would it, uh, would it happen if 1,300 uh, million people would stand up 
as Catholics in this case and respond to the call of Laudato Si. And even more, this document is expressed as meant to arrive to most people in this world. And the last word is parresia, the courage to go out, to go forth. Not only the discernment, not only the transformation, not only the recognition of the other, but the actual action, the transformation of reality. And this is what we, we're going through in this moment in the Amazon, trying to put together all of those realities, those marginal voices, which can actually offer the seeds for a different future and try to uh, respond to this reality and oppose to those uh, forces, like in the case of Brazil, where we'll have a total catastrophe in, the, uh, in this pandemic because of the lack of uh, values and commitment and the principles of life. So again, I just want to finish with this phrase from Teilhard de Chardin. And this might offer us some possibilities for a new perspective. We are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. Thank you. Sorry. Um, thank you very much, Mauricio. That was very inspiring and it was really good to hear from uh, the region that you are based and um, and to, uh, that you put such an emphasis on the issue of inequality and uh, by the same token on the wisdom and um, and the need for the voice, it's for a huge variety of voices to take us into a new future along with um, and trying to be um, with Mother Earth as well. So thank you so much, um, Mauricio. And um, now I'd like to um, introduce um, John McCarthy, um, a fellow Jesuit, I would like to say, but I work for the Jesuits, but, um, uh, it, and I've worked with John over the years. And so um, we've been collaborating on various things. So it's really lovely to have you on the screen with me. There, John, thank, thank you. you. John is, um, is a Jesuit. Um, he is a scientist also, and he's, he's an author. And um, his um, uh, uh, most recent book was Do Monkeys Go to Heaven? Finding God in Creation, in All Creation. And, um, and just to quote from the, uh, from the publisher who says the book um, about the book, removing the so often made distinction between secular and sacred McCarthy takes us on a journey that ponders nature's revelation of God and God's boundless love of us, showing us the need for us to be both scientific and spiritual. And um, John holds various degrees, um, including um, a doctorate, and uh, that one is in boreal forest ecology, but also um, has degrees in soil science and forest tree biology. And um, he currently works um, on the biodiversity of Newfoundland and Labrador lichens. Um, we could have a whole session on lichens with John, um, yes. but uh, Laurentian University mm. in Sudbury, Ontario. He is also the ecology facilitator for the Jesuits of Canada. So John, thank you very much for joining us. All right, well, thank you, Anne-Marie, for the very uh, generous uh, introduction. And I see there are 54 participants, so uh, welcome and thank you for taking the time to uh, be with us this afternoon. So I'll, uh, I'll share my screen, see how that works. Uh, okay, I'm gonna start the, uh, start the slideshow from the beginning. Let's see, Let's see if it comes up. Okay. I think everything is fine, at least from my end. I hope it's uh, fine from your end as well. Uh, in the few minutes that I have, I'd like to focus on uh, what, I'm call what I'm calling the contemplative ecology, uh, the need for a language of depth in what we may term a just transition. And I'll leave it to my colleagues on the panel this afternoon to, uh, you know, they talk about the political or the social or the uh, economic uh, dimensions uh, of these changes. But I'd like to look at a change of uh, a change of language and a change of uh, a change of discourse in some way. And so um, it's a beautiful painting from David Blackwood, a Newfoundland artist. Uh, as you know, because of the relative density of ice uh, versus seawater, about 98% of an iceberg is underwater. 
And this is a, a haunting image of fishermen in their boat. The boat has been uh, it's in the process of burning. They're in a life raft on the North Atlantic and all could be at an end. And yet below them in the depths of the North Atlantic, the humpback whale, uh, there's, there's a depth to life that they're not aware of in the midst of their, uh, in the midst of their, their possible loss of life. So I'd like to speak somewhat to this, to this uh, <clears throat> depth, if you will, this discourse about the nat and specifically about the natural world, about creation and, uh, and our relationship to creation and what kind of discourse we use when we talk about the, the natural world. Because I really think that we have a poverty of discourse when we come to the natural world. We've capitalized uh, nature and if we cannot give it a monetary value, when then it becomes of no value in many ways. And so in the end, <clears throat> everything is open for purchase. And, uh, and if we can't do that, then again, it's of no value. And yet we know, uh, and I'd like to use an example from uh, Northern Newfoundland. This is a, a nickel mine in Northern Newfoundland from Valley, Canada. Valley is a Brazilian company. It's one of the largest mining enterprises in the world. And in Sudbury, where I live, we have a major uh, uh, a valley uh, uh, mining operation for nickel. So this is a nickel mine in Northern Labrador. And to process the nickel from this, uh, from this mine, it was sent to Newfoundland to be processed. But so they had to drain a 50 hectare lake. So they took a wilderness lake, they drained it, they lined it, and they used it as a receptacle for 400,000 uh, tons of waste a year. Now in the ensuing debates uh, in public, the Newfoundland Minister of the Environment said this, don't let emotion get in the way. Science has shown that there is nothing about which to be concerned. But I would ask, how do we make decisions except through emotion, except through the human affect? And so in the discourse that happened at this time and in many other environmental problems and uh, that we have, the, there's a poverty of our discourse. Knowledge takes over wisdom, the intellect, uh, over imagination, reason at the expense of emotion, and the culture of science or the technocratic culture that uh, Pope Francis talks about in Laudato Si, science, economics, whatever it may be, takes over the culture of faith, of imagination, of kind of philosophical understanding of things. And so I'm thinking that we need a new discourse at least to, to, to bring to, to the conversation. Right now, it's the scientific, the financial, the political, the social discourse, all essential, all necessary, but in the end, I think insufficient to really help us for a conversion of heart, for a metanoia that Mauricio talked about. If we approach nature, Laudato Si, uh, paragraph 11, without an openness to awe and wonder, if we no longer speak the language of fraternity and beauty in our relationship to the world, our attitude will be that of masters, consumers, ruthless exploiters, unable to set limits on our immediate needs. By contrast, Pope Francis says, if we feel intimately united with all that exists, then sobriety and care will well up spontaneously. Awe and wonder, fraternity and beauty, uh, unity, uh, from there will come a sense of care. So for Pope Francis, intricate ecology, rather than a problem to be solved, the world is a joyful mystery to be contemplated with gladness and with praise. So I think in many ways today, our sense of the world as a joyful mystery to be contemplated is, uh, is very much lost in our conversation. And so the full expression, the full dimension of the human experience of uh, the created world is lost. Wonder, mystery, delight, awe, beauty, lament, joy, sacred care, contemplation, reverence, and love. And we rarely hear this in the public domain, in the public sphere. This language is privatized, is pushed to the side, and is not allowed to be given a voice in the public sphere. Just so just a few dimensions about, uh, uh, about how we understand nature. In many ways, I see nature as a, as a, as a word. If we have but eyes to see and ears to hear the language of creation, it's given, it's wild, it's incomprehensible, it's strange, it's mysterious. It's not of our making. It's not of our thoughts or of engineering projects or of fabrication. So with eyes to see and ears to hear, what can we hear? 
and what can we see and what can we touch. In many ways, we need to mourn nature. There's something about a sense of loss and grief and lament that we experience uh, uh, over these decades. Uh, Cormac McCarthy in his Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Road, uh, this is a quote from the end of uh, his book, uh, it's called The Road. It's about a post-apocalyptic world. He doesn't tell us why the world is that way, but it's a world of where humans have been used to violence and to cannibalism. Every line in this book is gray and full of uh, dust and death and destruction. Only at the end of the book, in the last paragraph, does he talk about color. Once there were brook trout in the streams and the mountains. You could see them standing in the amber current where the white edges of their fins wimple softly in the flow. They smelled of moss in your hand, polished and muscular and torsional. On their backs were vermiculate patterns that were maps of the world in its beginning, maps and mazes of a thing which could not be put back, not be made right again. In the deep glens where they lived, all things were older than man, and they hummed of mystery. Today, we experience much of a world which cannot be put back together again. And what does this do to us? This is the Lower Churchill River in northern Labrador several years ago. This is what it looks like today after the Newfoundland government uh, proposed and built a major hydroelectric development in the middle of the boreal forest. This landscape, this riverscape uh, for the surrounding people, the indigenous people, the Innu, and for the uh, other people who have settled there was a landscape that gave them life. But because of the reservoir, because of the mobilization of mercury in the boreal river systems in the reservoirs, these kind of signs will now go up, warning. So what gave life, what was possible for the future will now be a landscape and a riverscape that has the possibility of disease, of disruption, and maybe even death. All creatures, great and small. Since time immemorial, humans have always understood in a very in deep and intuitive way that all of us are somehow saved together. All of creation, whether it's the Garden of Eden mythology or the image of uh, Noah's Ark after the flood, two by two, all in it together for the future. Or well, the tree of life image in many cultures, a uh, wonderful painting by Blake Dabosky, a uh, Ojibwe artist who lives not too far from me here in Sudbury in, on Manitoulin Island. The crucified Christ uh, on the tree of life. All of creation is somehow crucified and all of creation awaits the resurrection with Christ as well. So all of it together, somehow together. And Charles Darwin provides us a scientific perspective on all this as well in the wonderful origin of the species. In the last image, the last line from his book, there is grandeur in this view of life, he says, the view of life as, uh, as evolution. From so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wondrous have been and are being evolved. So this, this is the same kind of image, if you will, as the Garden of Eden or Noah's Ark or the Tree of Life. It's just expressed in a scientific form. Forests as myth and memory. We are witnesses today to the greatest uh, deforestation uh, move in the entire planet, in the entire history of the planet. The Amazon, Equatorial Congo, Central Africa, Southeast Asia, and even in the boreal circumpolar boreal forests of Russia, Alaska, and Canada, we are witnessing a, a destruction of the forest in ways that we could never imagine. The word forest comes from the Latin forest, meaning outside. So in the early period, if you will, in the Roman period, the forest was always outside of the city, outside the walls. And so Robin Hood and his band of merry men were, became outlaws. Why? Because they lived in the forest. They lived outside the law. Uh, and so what happens when we lose forests? We have many ecological, cultural, economic reasons for the lament of the loss of forests. But there's also a loss of boundary, I think, and a loss of boundary that unsettles us. Because without an outside, there is no inside in which to dwell. And we seek asylum for grizzly bears and woodland caribou in Canada. What about asylum for the human spirit when there's no longer any uh, boundary, no longer any outside, then we lose something inside. 
space and place. Just like to draw your attention to the Torngat Mountains National Park here in Northern Labrador. Uh, I was privileged to uh, be able to spend several weeks there uh, a number of years ago with Parks Canada. And it's an amazing landscape. Uh, it's co-managed today by the Inuit, uh, the Nunatsivit people of Northern Quebec and Northern Labrador. And if you may have seen, some of you may have seen the tourism ads from the Newfoundland government. I was going to show it today, but uh, we fear the technical possibilities. Throughout this land, it says at the end of the two minute video, it says throughout this land for thousands of years, it has been said that everything has a spirit. Not surprisingly, it's where you might find your own. So it's a tourism ad to attract people to this land. And for many people, it's a wilderness landscape in Northern Canada, but it's also a lived landscape. People have lived on this land for thousands of years and now are able to work together to share it with those who come. So the landscape becomes for humans an inscape. And I think uh, there's a transformation of the landscape that gives us a sense of peace and a joy, and it really determines and defines who we are as humans. And I really think that care for creation, care for the world around us, for a common home, really implies a rootedness in which space you know, becomes a place. And that's really important. Wendell Berry, American conservationist, man of letters, farmer, people exploit what they have merely concluded to be of value but they defend what they love. And to defend what we love, we need a particularizing language for we, we love what we particularly know. You can only love what you know. And so we've given names to creatures throughout the years. We've named ourselves, our ancestors, Adam, Adama, of the earth, humans from the humus of creation. Eve, Aya, to live or to have life, the mother of all life. And as you know, in the early chapters of Genesis, Adam was given the wonderful vocation well, to name all creatures and to give them a name. And once a child has a name, there's a possibility of love. And Carl Linnaeus did the same thing, but from a scientific point of view in the uh, 18th century, he gave us the Latin binomial, you know, Latin words for the genus and the species. So we're now able to name uh, creatures and only by naming creatures do we enter into a fullness of relationship, the possibility of mutuality and the possibility of love. These are some words from the British uh, Oxford Junior Dictionary. You recognize some of them, they come from the British landscape, at least for most of us here in the Northern Hemisphere, you know, ivy, newt, dandelion, bluebell, pasture, etc. All these names are no longer in the revised Oxford Junior Dictionary. They have been replaced with these names, committee, blog, bullet point, chat room, celebrity, you get the point. If there's no longer any name, if you don't have any names for creatures or for the natural world, then we will no longer have any possibility to relate and to love and to care for. Will there come a day when the only apple we will know is that which we plug into our walls? And the only blackberry we will savor, if you're a blackberry person, of course, is our cellular phone. So a final word, nature, the created, created world are not only ecosystems and objects of scientific inquiry. And yes, they are indeed that, but not only. Nature do not, does not only provide us with goods and services to make us live, enable us to live. Yes, they do. We know that so well, otherwise we couldn't be here today. But nature and creation is also a place and a purveyor of meaning. You know, I think Pope Francis his brilliant idea of integral ecology. We live as in language, we live in relationality. And, um, you know, our scientific analysis, our technical finesse, our economic decisions, they're necessary, but never sufficient because analysis in the end does not transform, motivate or convert a person. But I think there's a sense of a contemplative language, a prayerful spiritual dimension that Pope Francis talks about in Laudato Si, a conversion, a metanoia that enables us to, uh, to, to engage it as well. And so how to embrace the fullness of the human experience of creation, wonder, mystery, delight, awe, beauty, 
lament, joy, sacred care, contemplation, reverence, and love. We need words for this. We need a language for this. And this language is really needed in the public discourse. And for any kind of just transition, whatever that form may take politically, economically, scientifically, socially, I don't think it's going to be very difficult to do unless we have a language that will enable us to uh, enact it in the first place. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay, it's a sec. Sorry. Trying to do too many things at the same time. Thank you so much, John, for that, that beautiful uh, presentation. And uh, it was really, really great to hear. Uh, I'd like to, to now uh, introduce to you uh, Miriam Vilela. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce Miriam to you. Uh, Miriam is the executive director of the Earth Charter International Secretariat in Costa Rica. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Miriam in the uh, Earth Charter Center for Education for Sustainable Development over the past five years. And uh, she's an incredible person with all kinds of gifts as a facilitator, but also a really great depth of knowledge that just comes from uh, a whole history of having worked uh, with the Earth Charter process really from the, the very beginning, but certainly I think going back to the Rio Summit in 1992, but certainly since 1996, uh, she was uh, a key person in facilitating that whole interactive collaborative uh, process, which actually led to the Charter. And she's worked with it ever since. So uh, not only a lot of talents in terms of uh, education, but also working in kind of policy making uh, fora as well. Uh, so, and, and I think, you know, the, the importance of the Earth Charter at this time in terms of guiding values and looking toward a just transition, I can't think of really a better person to, to speak to us about this than Miriam. So welcome today. It's so wonderful to have you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Anne-Marie, uh, the Jesuit Forum, Forum for organizing this, and uh, I was very pleased to hear uh, John, Ali, and Mauricio, uh, as the previous speakers. Um, of course, much of my work is very much related to what they shared, so I hope I won't take much of your time now. I want to thank uh, all the participants that are actively listening to us here today, and um, and just to, to offer some reflections on the fact that, well, I think this forum was organized because uh, in June 2015, five years ago, uh, the Pope launched the, uh, the encyclical, Laudato Si. It was quite important. Uh, I think when it was launched, we all celebrated uh, the importance of that document to influence our minds, our, our hearts. In decision makers, I, I remember that it was launched in June because the climate change summit was going to take place in December, the Paris summit, and I think um, part of the decision was that the Laudato Si should influence the Paris um, climate change summit, and I think it it did quite well in that sense. So when the Laudato Si was launched, um, from a nurse charter perspective, we we celebrated because not only it was it's very similar the vision that is articulated in the Laudato Si is very similar to what is articulated in the Earth Charter that was launched in June uh, 20, 2000 so 15 years before uh, the coming of the Laudato Si <clears throat> so a lot of um, key ideas that uh, is articulated in the Laudato Si such as the whole notion of care care for our common home the whole notion of responsibility, interdependence, the principle of a precautionary approach are very much uh, also articulated uh, in their charter. <clears throat> but also the fact that the Pope um, makes a reference to their charter in the Laudato Si. So right after that, we, we put together um, a publication that tries to look at the synergies between the Laudato Si and the what is articulated in their chatter. Um, I'm going to share with you just a brief um, image of that, I mean. 
So it was paragraph 207, it's the version there that is in, in Spanish, but we put together this publication as a sort of as an effort uh, to look at the synergies between the Laudato Si and their charter. It's available in Spanish and also in English, and it has the voices of various thinkers from our times that are looking at how this of Capra, uh, Mary Evelyn Tucker, and etc. that are articulated some interesting essays in this. So I share this with you because you may be interested in taking a look at this publication. So the Earth Charter, uh, very briefly, uh, let me share with you that it's, um, it's a document, can be seen, or it involves a document that is the result of this uh, participatory process, multicultural, multi-sectoral consultation process that, in, in, that offered input to the drafting of this charter that was drafted over a period of five to six years. And it was launched uh, in the year 2000. So it's a boom, uh, youth and etc. So let me share with you very briefly well, the content of their charter, what, what you may find and how and, and invite you to look at it again as, a, as an instrument, as a, an ethical reference or as an ethical compass for decision making, for policy making, or use it as, as an educational instrument to stimulate dialogue. But there, what the Rashada does is, is it takes, uh, it dares to articulate, again, uh, values and principles that could guide humanity uh, towards a more just, sustainable and peaceful world. And what is very important for us to, to understand is its systemic nature that is articulated in their chatter. So it starts with a, an ethic of care and respect. So it's at the heart of their chatter. You know? So uh, the whole notion of respect and care is very much uh, the foundation of the whole vision that is articulated in their chatter. But it's very important for us to emphasize that it's not just about the ethic of care and, resp and respect among humans, but uh, care and respect to the large living world. So it articulates a language of community of life. <clears throat> so that's the first pillar of their charter. And then the second pillar is on ecological integrity, and it has many values and principles around it. The third one being <clears throat> social and economic justice. And the fourth uh, pillar, the fourth part or dimension of their charter are on principles around democracy, nonviolence, and peace. But very important for us to see the relationship between all of this. And I'm going to stress it again, because sometimes we come from um, the door of an environmental movement, and uh, or sometimes we may come from the door of a social movement or human rights, social justice, and uh, or a movement of peace. And what what was very important in the whole process of their shadow was to look at the synergies. Um, it's kind of a, a bringing together these different rivers or these different currents in one common river. And the foundation of that is really the current of, or, or the, the roots of that uh, tree, if you will, or the current of that river is really uh, founded on an ethic of care and respect for the community of life. So that, that gives you kind of a, an image or a gist of what you can find um, articulated in the in their charter. But again, very important uh, also to mention that um, it, it, their charters are organized not only around these uh, four parts that I just mentioned, but it starts with a preamble and it ends with a sort of a conclusion that's called the way forward. And the preamble uh, has have, have many purposes, I would say, but one of them uh, could be to help us expand and deepen our consciousness with regards to our sense of responsibility and with regards to how we ought to relate uh, to the large living world. Um, the purpose not only of the preamble, but of the whole Earth Charter is really to help us rethink how we relate or rethink about, about this human nature earth relationship and invite us to think that we are part of. So it's very similar to what the Pope wrote in the Laudato Si on integral ecology. <clears throat> so the notion of responsibility 
uh, from the sense of um, responsibility with ourselves, but also expand it to our responsibility to our community, uh, to the human family. So that goes beyond or across any cultural divide or political divide, but also it goes beyond that and uh, it, it invites us to elevate our sense of responsibility and care uh, uh, that goes beyond human beings. So care and, and feeling and sense of responsibility with the community of life. And it goes beyond that. It's not only a sense of responsibility uh, with present generations of human beings, but also a sense of responsibility to future generations. So care for the community of life, care for, um, again, expanding the sense of, of community that we belong to, our family, uh, our most immediate family and local community, but also we as part of human community, we as part of the earth community. And, uh, and I think I always look at this as, a, as an invitation for us to really envision ourselves as part of this earth community as part of the community of life and uh, invite us, okay, what's my role here as, as human? Um, so very briefly, uh, let me go into just two, two of the four pillars of the Earth Charter. The first one, I invite you to look at it as, again, as the roots of, of a tree, because the roots gives the foundation of the rest of the trees. And it's the pillar one or part one of the Earth Charter that, is, uh, that articulates the whole uh, articulated four main principles and a number of supporting principles around this notion of respect and care for the community of life. Um, and again, it goes in, uh, it's kind of invites us to take our, our sense of care and respect to these various levels, you know, care and respect among humans, among the society, uh, with the large living world, but also across generations. So you see those ideas articulated in the four um, first principles of the charter. And then I would like to jump into uh, pillar three, which is the whole notion of social and economic justice that is articulated in their charter. And I think um, what, what is it's really a huge challenge for us is to uh, move away from um, these binary thinking or fragmented thinking that uh, okay let's let's focus on social justice or let's focus on environmental protection e ecological integrity but rather to see the interconnections of all of them um, I think that that is one of the biggest challenges for our for educating our minds and our hearts uh, but also to infuse in our education systems is how to move away from this fragmented thinking, that well, if I'm looking at social issues, I cannot be looking at uh, all the ecological uh, protections, uh, concerns, or challenges of our world. But therefore, when we look at their shadow, and I think when we look at La La to see, uh, we need it's kind of an invitation for us to to change our lenses uh, and and be really concerned with uh, with how how these different fields or how these different concerns relate to one another. So pillar three uh, articulates the values and principles around the uh, eradication of poverty, uh, gender, equality and e equity and so forth. And um, there are four principles there, principle nine to 12. And principle 12 is really about dignity, inclusion and well-being. And it was really um, a principle that was uh, largely discussed in the mid 90s and the end of the year 2000 when the Earth Charter was launched because it articulates the whole notion of eliminate discrimination of all kinds. So the whole notion of, um, or the importance to eliminate uh, discriminations of any kind it could be dis discrimination based on race, color, religion, uh, sexual or orientation, uh, language and etc. And uh, and of course, what we are living, uh, especially nowadays, it's in the news. But we have been living for the past uh, centuries. Is is really this discrimination with those who are different? Because that's what we learn in our upbringing. You know? And um, 
um, we did receive a number of um, attacks uh, from movements, from the right-wing movements, or so people from the right-wing right movements around this precise, this principle 12A, because uh, it affirms the importance to eliminate discrimination of all kinds, such as, and it goes into specific um, uh, discrimination based on race and sexual orientation. And people interpret that as, okay, the Earth Charter is promoting homosexualism, for instance, no? So people quickly, uh, depending on our worldview, jump into conclusions and twist words. And, and uh, so anyway, we I remember having to go even to to the foundations of the Catholic Church, because this was the kind of attack received from um, uh, people from the right wing uh, of, of religious groups. Uh, but having to go into this, the Bible and having to go into uh, even the, the creation, a lot of the, the, the documents of the, the, the creation of the Catholic Church, that also affirms the importance of discrimination, of, of eliminating discrimination of, of all kinds. So uh, I'm mentioning this because I think it depends on how we perceive words. Um, and different groups can jump into different conclusions and, and attack what they think goes against uh, their cultural values. Um, and I think one, one of the, the challenges we have is to overcome uh, this notion that the different is, is bad for us and really look at common ground. And the only way for us to, to collaborate as a, as a global community, as, as, as human family, is to have a set of um, uh, basic shared values of, uh, that form a sort of shared vision of our common good and in, in, in the direction of how we, we should uh, uh, go about towards uh, turning the curse, turning the direction of our world towards a more just, sustainable, and peaceful world. So um, I would say that that's, that's one of the, the objectives or the goals of the Earth Shadow Movement. And I invite you just to look at that the purpose of the Earth Shadow Movement and the document is to expand our understanding and our consciousness with regards to how we ought to, to relate among ourselves to others and to the larger living world. And it seeks to nurture a culture of responsibility, care and respect among humans uh, and uh, care and respect to the large living world. So uh, it's of course very similar to, to the, the purpose and to what is articulated in the Laudato Si, uh, Apart from the fact that their charter is, is a known religious um, uh, document or, or movement, so it's, it certainly can speak to, to um, not only to movements of uh, faith, but to the, uh, any kind of uh, sector or culture, I would say, and uh, society. So with this, I would like to thank you for your time and we'll be happy to to continue our conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miriam. Uh, we're going to now have a chance to uh, listen to all the panelists a bit more. We, we have about, uh, you know, probably 10 or 12 minutes for questions. Uh, so I'll invite the, the, all the panelists to, to come on at this time. And we probably will only have, there were lots of questions, but we probably only have time for two. So, uh, and so the first one I think that I'd like to ask uh, is that John spoke of the importance of imagination and experiencing life through the eyes of others. And while Mauricio also spoke of the value of alterity, I think these are, so the importance of these diversity of voices. Uh, so based on that, how, how do we make sure that a wide diversity of voices, actors and perspectives are part of the process of, of moving toward a just transition. And also, if you'd like to, you could add, like, what would be one thing that you imagine might be actually, if you were kind of trying to imagine what a just transition looks like, what's one thing that might look really different? Uh, so, so I'll just kind of throw that out to, to panelists and uh, any reflections you have on, on, on those questions.
Maybe I could start, Mark. Uh, sure, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just one thing that strikes me is um, maybe is the focus on what kind of process is needed often. I know I know at the Jesuit Forum, you have the, you know, the, this kind of conversation, these forums that allow people of diverse opinion and different uh, foci to, to come together. And uh, I often found that uh, often there's very little of that. You know, we tend to polarize or tend to, get into silos rather quickly, and then we end up throwing rocks at each other. But is there a way in which all the different, uh, just say, for example, the environmental question, you know, the, the industrial, the political, indig indigenous people, the local people, often I find there's not many fora where people can come together and to, uh, and to have a safe and open and free uh, conversation on these various issues. Uh, that's... Uh, that's the thing that I've experienced a lot. I know in my own life. So whatever we can do to enable a free and open conversation, especially at the political level, you know, for voices to be heard. Yeah, that's, that's always a thing for me, I find. So anyone else, especially also about how to make sure we're hearing the voices that maybe haven't been heard in the past and how to make sure that they're really part of this process of the just transition and what, what might it actually look like? If I may, Mark, uh, from our own experience with the Amazon Synod, what we did was to create a new methodology in which we could ensure, ensure to break the hierarchical dynamic of the church and make sure that our existing network in which indigenous peoples and farmers, communities take part of, could have voice. And not only that, uh, it was not a simulation because sometimes in the past people make some type of simulation of listening, but we, uh, with the support of some universities, created some specific software to make sure that we would gather all of those voices, make sure that we would properly uh, hear them out, and then put them into an official document of the church. It was a true uh, rupture of, uh, of what was happening before. That's why, as Miriam was saying, we were very heavily attacked during the Amazon Synod because uh, the, the media, the very right-wing media was using this uh, speech or this uh, uh, excuse of uh, an unorthodox type of church, a pagan church, when in fact the problem was the arising of an integral ecology approach with a concrete expression in a territory where the indigenous peoples themselves were welcomed by the Pope and also the Catholic Church to speak out. You couldn't imagine how strongly they spoke during the formal sessions of the, of the Synod. And this is something that we had to fight and push very hard on. And it was not only those uh, 20, 25 uh, men and women from indigenous communities, but the actual uh, thousands of people in the listening processes. So we could see that synodality is possible, but, need, but you need to break some of the existing structures. This is a periphery entering the center to illuminate it. We were not trying to overcome, but to really uh, offer a different uh, uh, type of vision. And yes, of course, the difference is that you have a Pope who really wanted that to happen. And he felt the boost of those dynamics and those voices into his own attempt to change and reform the church. So this is, I think, really, really important. And uh, we need to maintain those things. And just to finish, the integral ecology category, again, I feel is the single most important category, maybe of this generation, certainly from Laudato Si, because this is not something of the Pope. It is the gathering of the knowledge of humankind the different uh, uh, um, wisdoms in the world, but breaking this silo type of approach and offering this um, challenge, which is not finished, we have not done enough to really embrace that challenge of putting together ecology, social sciences, politics, culture, indigenous wisdom, environmental issues, human issues, and also the justice between generations. We, I, I, we are uh, here severing, we are trying to collaborate more directly with the uh, Laudato Si Research Institute uh, with the, uh, associated with the Jesuits in Oxford in uh, the British uh, province. And there is something new emerging in that sense, 
but it needs to offer a different epistemology, truly. Just a final word from uh, a quote from Kierkegaard. Life can only be understood looking backwards, but it can only be lived looking onwards. Thanks, Mauricio. Uh, Ali, I wonder if from, you know, I know in terms of, of young adults and youth in, in the movements, there's been such a great uh, emphasis on, on this, this thing of, of incorporating the different voices and, and different people taking leadership in movements. So I wonder if you have something to share about that or an insight. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, the first one is really just actually being intentional about it, right? And, and, and getting ready to scan correct it every time. And I think we've messed that up several times, you know, trying to put forward uh, voices and being told that's not actually the way you do it, that's still performative, that's still superficial and standing corrected. And I think the youth is pretty good at doing that usually because we're, I think a lot of youth still have that humility of like, I don't know that much and we know we don't know that much. So being ready um, and you were asking, you know, what we could see in the recovery. Um, and I think COVID taught us that when governments or any institution communicates all the time, like they're doing around COVID because they know that they have that pressure. So when they're explicitly, you know, transparent and, and um, they're trying to be transparent all the time, they're trying to communicate, good things come out of that because now people feel like they, they do have a say, or at least they have, um, you know, they're being communicated too, so they communicate back. I, I've only seen that during COVID. So I think um, these two things and very, I mean, the intentionality was taught by like the Black Lives Matters as well. They asked us, you know, silence your social media for a few days to let other voices come. And, and we just, we did, we did stay quiet and we did like decide, commit to it uh, long enough, not just one hour or one day, but just a, a week so that other voices would come. Um, so I think it's that, it's being intentional and, and putting out there, it's always the same rule, putting out there what you want to receive back. So if you're being transparent, the public and the people will uh, give that back, I think. Thank you. Uh, and I don't know, Miriam, I, I'm thinking about the experience of, of true how the Earth Charter was originally done, but also, you know, now we have all these these different kinds of, of uh, ways of, of that, that were, were more difficult 10 or 20 years ago. But uh, in the experience of the Earth Charter, I know that it really has become an international movement of people on, on every continent at this point. Uh, so about those different voices, those different actors, but also, or, or if there's anything specific thing you would draw out of the Earth Charter that would say, you know, this is, this is part of something we sometimes don't think about when we think about just transition. <clears throat> um, well, I could say so many things, but briefly, I, I, I could say <clears throat> just um, when I think of uh, the transition that is so required in, in your first question, I envision us seeing the world with different eyes. Um, it's almost like I envision this picture of us cleaning up our, our eyeglasses and, and just being able to see what we are not seeing and being able to perceive um, the connections uh, among us. Um, I think uh, humanity is walking around our lives in, in our different countries and worlds uh, myopic <laughs> with, with eyes that are not really able to see uh, the connections, eyes that are not able to see the consequences of our in actions and decisions. So when you asked, okay, what, how do you envision this, uh, this future to be? I envision the future to be with humans that can see more, uh, that can see clear, uh, see further, uh, see relationships, connections. Um, now, how to get there is the good question. <laughs> how to get us to have a 2020 eyesight. Um, um, I think it's an ongoing process of uh, transforming education, transforming the way we communicate. We tend to communicate um, um, kind of in a way without listening to the other. We tend to communicate by, by sharing what I think is right. 
And therefore, if I don't learn to listen to the other, it's hard for the other to listen to me. So it kind of there's so much learning that needs to, to take place um, for us to take to to take humanities toward towards that aspiration, you know, that uh, imaginative goal that we, we have in mind. So anyway, these are just a few thoughts. Sorry. Thank you so much. I mean, I know I I, I would like to ask another question, but I don't think we probably have time for another one. I, I just like to say, uh, you know, I think that this idea of listening to diverse voices, even the voices of the more than human world at the same time, but particularly also the human voices that have been marginalized is so important in terms of the creativity that uh, we really need to try to imagine the other, that other world that is possible. Uh, and it, you know, and to be bold in our imagination uh, and and bold in the way that we, we seek to work in a different way, which is more participatory, certainly inclusive, but that gives priority to those voices and to those perspectives that we might not have heard before. So I'll, I'll hand things over to Anne-Marie for the conclusion. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And um, thank you to you, Ali, Mauricio, uh, Miriam, and John. It was a really wonderful sharing and there was a lot of synergy in what you all had to say. And, um, and I think everything sort of took my mind back to what Ali said at the beginning, which is around organizing and about engaging. And, um, and we need the new eyes to see uh, so that we can engage and go forward. And, and I, I just feel that this was a wonderful uh, last um, episode of the Jesuit Forum first ever webinar series. <laughs> so thank you so much for being with us. Thank you to all of you um, who are participating, listening, sending questions and comments and uh, just being present here. It was wonderful that that you're with us. And um, we will be sending a recording to everybody. I will try and cut off my false start at the beginning. But, um, uh, but along with that, we'll probably send a short survey so that you can, um, we'd really like feedback. So we won't be doing another webinar webinar for a while, but we'll have a lot of time to plan something better or build on what we've done, let's say. Um, if you haven't seen the latest issue of our small publication, which I mentioned earlier, Open Space, and I think Victoria's put something in our chat box there um, with a link. Um, it is on just transition and transformation, so I invite you to take a look. Um, and also, um, we, we do have um, a guide for dialogue. Uh, which emphasizes precisely what uh, Miriam was talking about, which is listening and seeing things in a different way. And it's a guide for dialogue on Let Out of Sea. So that exists in English and French and um, is, is promoted for group use. And, um, and the other one that we have, which is really starts from the whole idea that Mauricio was referring to, which is growth, uncontrolled growth, which starts from there, but goes into and ends up really with Buen Vivir or living well, and it's called living with limits, living well. And um, so um, thank you so much, everyone. And with that, peace and health. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you, Mauricio, Marian, and Ali. Thank you. Thank you very thank much you. for the invitation. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Wonderful to see you all.